one son, and he died on the cross because he loved us so much, so that we might live to worship him. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for restoring our broken relationship with our heavenly Father once again through the death that you have uh, endured and, uh, and the life that you rose from the grave to give all of us to all those who believe in you. So we give you praise. We honor you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, just turn to somebody, greet them in the, in the name of the Lord and let them know how much, how happy you are to see them. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Amen, Lord. Praise your Father. <clears throat> I think so, yeah. yeah. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. Well, good. As you're settling down, um, I know many of you uh, are aware today is Father's Day, right, you know, we need to have some little uh, light stuff going on before we get into the serious stuff. I have a few things that I'd like to share on a lighter note. It's about new and improved, new and improved. The little girl was sitting in her father's lap as he read her a good night story. From time to time, she would take her eyes off the book and reach up to touch his wrinkled cheek. By and by, she was alternately stroking her own cheeks and then his again. So finally, she spoke, Daddy, did God make you? Yes, sweetheart, he answered. God made me a long time ago. Oh, she said. Then, Daddy, did God make me too? Yes, sweetheart, indeed, honey. God made you just a little while ago. Oh, she said. Feeling their respective faces again, she observed, God is getting better at it now, isn't he? <laughs> Who is the real boss? Well, five sons had these questions to their father, and they asked, who is most obedient? Father replied, the obedient one doesn't ever talk back to mother. And one of his five sons quickly replied, okay, dad, you are the most obedient then. <laughs> well, what's the difference between a Mother's Day and a Father's Day? And what is a Father's Day for a child? It's just like... Another Mother's Day to him. The only difference, however, is that you don't need to spend so much. <laughs> so fathers, don't expect great, great gifts, right? I mean, fathers can teach the children through verbal and nonverbal uh, uh, communications, right? So science teacher was asking John in the school, uh, when is the boiling point reached? And John replied, when my father sees my report card. <laughs> well, if you do well, maybe that won't happen, right? And teacher calls home on the phone. You say, Michael has a cold and can't come to school today. And teacher said, to who am I speaking? And the voice said, this is my father. Well, children sometimes don't know how to lie. <laughs> well, you know, so looking at some of these uh, things, we are, uh, we kind of uh, see how the importance of the fathers and in a lighthearted way we, we think about. Uh, uh, but fathers are very, very important, you know, in the, in the lives of the, the family. The, that's how, in the children in particular, God has an order when he creating the, 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 the world, the families, he created male and, and female, the Bible says. A mother and father, both are necessary 
required in the family for children to grow healthy. It is not two mothers raising families or not two fathers raising families. That is not the order. Uh, uh, that's not what God intended. And also God is not intended for uh, our single dads or single moms to, to be raising families. But that's how it has been. It is in, in, uh, 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 in the world that is living in. It is a broken world. It's not the ideal way. But the ideal way is that in a healthy family, in the families where God would have fathers and mothers working together, raising uh, uh, children. And uh, if that is, when that is broken, some of the things that are, are the, the result of that we see uh, in these statistics, for example, uh, uh, it says almost nine out of 10 adolescents uh, ages 15 to 17 living with their biological married parents reported to be in excellent or every good health compared to less than eight of 10 of those living with a single parent. It's not that the single parents aren't doing good. They are doing good to the best they could. They are raising the family's children. But a study of 3,400 middle schoolers indicated that not living with both biological parents, uh, 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 the risk of having uh, an affective disorder. So these are some things that we need to understand uh, what's happening in the, in the world. Uh, but on the other hand, we want to look to, to God and uh, as a model. And God, and we want to thank God for the fathers in our lives, in my life, in our lives. We are thinking about our dads, aren't we, today? Um, you know, my, my dad, uh, I was thinking about, of him this morning as I woke up. Um, you know, he, he taught me one thing, that is to go to church every Sunday. He would be the first one to get up on Sunday mornings, and he makes sure that everybody is ready to go to Sunday. He never skipped a church one Sunday. And he would read his Bible. So that's so precious to me. When, uh, when, I, when he died, I was not there. Uh, and uh, when I went back, one thing I wanted to take it with me when I came back to the U.S. is the Bible that he read. And I would see, every, when I see that, how... how, how uh, 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 earnest reader he is. He would mark everything. You know, just uh, that's that's what he he taught taught me. Uh, I want us to uh, 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 I want us to thank our our fathers today. I would like I would like to honor also all the fathers that are here. If you are a father or a, a godfather or a spiritual father, would you please stand up that we want to honor and we give praise to the Lord. Let's bless all our fathers that are here and, um, and, I, and the godfathers, the spiritual fathers. And I want you, just stand up as I pray. I want you to think about one good thing about your dad. One. Maybe many good things that you can think, but there's one that you're grateful to God for. Father, I want to thank you for my dad who, who raised a family of five, uh, my three sisters and uh, my brother and I. Lord, how he modeled um, what it is to love you, to, to be in the fellowship with the other believers every Sunday after Sunday. Thank you for his model and for his example. Lord, I thank you for all the fathers that are here, Lord God. May we model... Uh, um, uh, what it is to be uh, a father that you would want us to be by looking at you as our ultimate father of our souls, father of all human beings, Lord. So, God, we thank you, and I ask your blessings upon every father here, Lord. Uh, give them strength and wisdom to take care of all that they need to do, Lord God. We thank you, and we praise you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So, let's put our hands together, and one more time, happy Father's Day to you all. Um, I tell you, don't expect great things from your children. If they can give you a little dinner, maybe, out of mercy, 
uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the dinner because you need strength. You know why fathers need strength? Because they have to do all kinds of uh, mighty works, things like ki- picking up the dead birds for children, right? Or uh, killing the spiders. They need strength. So, so I, don't, I don't know what's coming on my way, but we will see what uh, God has for us today. He's got something for us. I want to begin with a, a little story of my fatherhood as it as I, uh, I'm blessed uh, by three beautiful uh, uh, daughters, intelligent daughters. Uh, uh, I'm a, a humble father of these three beautiful girls. One of them was here, she was singing uh, today. Uh, when they were little children, I was with uh, Youth With A Mission as I would travel around. Uh, and uh, as, well, as I was traveling, to taking, it would take me away from, uh, from my family quite often. And, and one of those teaching trips uh, uh, that was, Jemima was infant, very little, and Joanna was uh, um, two, two and a half, three years old, yeah, right, around that time. So I called back home to talk to them from another town. Uh, I talked with Wilma and then talked with Joanna. And then while I was talking, uh, Wilma put the microphone, no cell phones in those days, microphone to, to Jemima's ears. So later on she told me, Jimmy was years popped up, lit up by listening to my voice. And that told me something, that how important a father is in the lives of children, especially when they are young. So on this Father's Day, as we celebrate, there is something to be is said about the, 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 the important role fathers would play in the families. And you and I cannot be a father unless and until we are fathered by the perfect father in heaven. We need to be fathered by him first. You know what? Everybody here, either uh, uh, you you have children, no children, grown up or young, all of us have a deep desire inside of us. You know, we are little children, little boys and little girls. We want our father to pick us up and hold us close to his heart. There is a craving that is there in every child's heart, and then every father will be doing that for us today. But the importance, I I cannot minimize the importance of the fathers uh, in the homes. So what what is the effect of the the absence of that? The the United States of America, the census of uh, uh, the Bureau shows that nearly 18.5 18.5 million children grow up without their fathers. That has led to the United States of owning the title. We are world leaders in many ways. This is, not, this is a wrong way. Title of the world's leader in fatherlessness. How could we counter that? The, how could we reverse that data by being the father, if you are, but the, the, the father that God would want you to be. Or for the men, I appeal that you could be a spiritual father. You may not have your own children, but you could be a spiritual father for many. As Paul would say, you have many teachers, but I have only one, me as your spiritual father. So you could be a spiritual father as you go on. To, uh, for, the, for our study today from the book that we, uh, gospel we read, uh, I was reading another book uh, uh, which I was so blessed by this teaching uh, on the Father Heart of God by Floyd Mecklen. Um, he used to be the leader of Youth with a Mission. He would be a, a tall guy, uh, six foot plus, you know, he very tall, lived in you know, Amsterdam and uh, um, in Afghanistan, Kabul, ministered, and, and he's a big man big heart, and I tell you, he would reveal the Father heart of God through his teachings. And uh, this is what he would say in, one, in his book. Most people do not know God as a loving father. They do not consider him someone to love and trust, worthy of their absolute loyalty and commitment. Whether a person is a Christian or not, at one time or another, everyone seriously thinks about who God is, and what he is like. Many people long to know God personally, 
but imagine him as a remote, impersonal being who cannot be known. Others yearn for a relationship with him, but cling to the misconception that he sits in heaven wearing a black suit and twisting his long gray beard as he glares down, seeking to judge anyone who dares smile on a Sunday. Well, he's speaking maybe in a Calvinistic place there. Uh, but that shows off how people perceive who God is, his father heart. What is your perception of God today? Are you starving for love and affection? Well, I will share today how God expressed his father's heart in four ways toward his children, towards you and me or all those who believe in him, so that you might come to know God and trust him. So I call this the father heart of God. For me, among all the images of God that is, are shown in the Bible, this speaks to me uh, very dearly, clearly. That is, God's, the most loving image is that God is our Father. That's what the Bible, the Bible authors portrayed as the father of all humanity. In Isaiah, if you read 63, verse 16, it says, Surely you are still our Father. Even if Abraham and Jacob would disown us, Lord, you would still be our father. You are our redeemer from ages past. God wanted to be the father of creation. He is. But there are many people who have rejected God. They didn't want him to be their God, especially Israel, the nation of Israel. Over and over again, they've turned their backs on, on God, and they didn't want him to be their father. The trend continued all the way up to the time of Jesus. When Jesus walked on the earth in John 1st chapter 9, uh, 9, verses 9 to 13, this is what it says. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And they are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So when we believe in Jesus, when you and I believe in Jesus, we become the children of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know that you are a child of God? If you believe in Jesus, turn to somebody and say, you are a child of God. You are a child of God. And he has given the right to become the children of God. That's what it says here. And Jesus himself called God my father. Amen? If you see that, many times he says, my father and I are one. They're not two different ones, but God, Father, and Jesus are the one. And then, uh, and then he showed us how God's father heart is like through many of his teachings. And one of the things that today we see uh, uh, is uh, a parable. Actually, this is a, uh, a parable connected to the, uh, a chain of parables of three. So we are picking up the third parable here uh, from that uh, chain, uh, and let's see what we can learn. There are four different, four principles we can learn here. Uh, verses 11 to 12, Luke uh, 15th chapter, verses 11 to 12. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate. Now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Looks like the father here seemed to be doing very well. You know, he's got an estate going on. Uh, a lot of resources, a lot of wealth was uh, there in that so very wealth, wealthy person. And his two children, and he wanted to give them anyway, uh, to, uh, divide his estate to both of them equally. And uh, here, this father in the story, as we uh, unfold, he represents the heavenly father. How so? This is the first 
uh, um, uh, attitude, first nature of what father is like. He says, a father who gives generously to his children. He's, re he's reflecting the generosity of God's father heart here. And the same way God, our father, is a generous God, big and generous God. And he's got so much to give to us. How, is, how do we see that here in the, uh, in the scripture? For example, 1 John 3rd chapter, verse 1, it says, Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father. Amen. Comes from him. And he generously gives everything for our enjoyment to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share with others. That's what we read in 1 Timothy 6, chapter 17, 18. So our Father in heaven is not a stingy Father like maybe some of our earthly fathers. He is very generous. Think about all this generous the nature that about around us, the bounty of this beautiful creation of his. Whatever God does, he is generous in his giving, in his doing. And that's what we need, we need to understand. The first and foremost, uh, the prodigal son's father, he gave that estate without any question. And it says that God is showing his heart as generous to his children. And what else we read here? First, uh, verse 13. And a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. What a waste of resources. He could have at least put the money in a bank or something to, to, to get more interest. But he was wasting his resources away. So what was the father of prodigal son doing at the time? It says he was patiently waiting. So God's father heart is not only generous, but it is also expressed towards us in patience. Uh, he's waiting patiently for all his prodigal sons and daughters to come back home to return to him. If the father in the story represents God of heaven as a generous and patient God, who does the prodigal son represent, you think, in the story? Represents us, prodigal sons and daughters, all of us, you know, we, who, all of those who move away from God uh, in pursuit of what? They move away from God in search of pleasures, in search of comforts, or in search of enjoyment. And they waste all those good resources that they have been given. They squander that. What are the resources that they have been given? Money, uh, and God gives them intelligence. They, they squander that. They, God gives, they gives them physical health. Uh, health. They waste that uh, physical energy on what? Things that do not truly satisfy them. That's what happened to the prodigal son. You know, he, he wasted all of his money. He finally, where did he end up? He ended up in a, a pigsty. It's not a five-star uh, hotel or something. It's a pig's den. That's what he was. He was reduced to so low in that place because everything has been gone, taken away. And uh, yeah, he, he, he was, uh, uh, while he was in that particular situation away from, from um, home and from the father, I wondered, what did the father of prodigal son do? What must have been? How long was he was gone for? And what was he doing around that time? And, uh, uh, but the records doesn't show us, but one thing we know that he didn't, he didn't go after the sons where he went. You know, he, he didn't ask uh, his son, for example, could you share me your location? Wherever, you know, on the cell phones, these days people share their locations. He was not following where my son was going. What was he doing? You know, he just let him go. He, he, 
Yeah, you want to go? Well, I don't want to hold you back. This is the money, just is gone. You know, sometimes we need to have that attitude of letting our children go out into the world to explore. And all along, while they're out there, it is not reckless, it is irresponsible for you to do that. All along, what you're doing is you are waiting at home patiently, praying for that child's well-being. Amen? That child's protection. Because you cannot always be there to protect your children. Amen? You're not always present like God who is. God is present, omnipresent, everywhere at all times. So what we do is, God, I want to bring my daughter into your hands. I want to entrust my child into your hands, my son, my, my, uh, my girls to you, Lord. You are the protector. And God is the one who ultimately can protect our children. So we need to see that uh, a model here, a posture that uh, uh, the prodigal son's father did, father, father has taken. And the same posture that God is taking towards all of us. What is he doing now? This is, let's turn with Isaiah, in Isaiah 65th chapter, verse 2. It gives us, it says, Our heavenly father opens his arms to his rebellious children. It says, all day long. Amen? Think of God. God is stretching his hands towards every prodigal son, every prodigal daughter to come back to him. It's a daily routine. His arms are open wide for you to run back to him, to run towards him. So our God is a generous God. Our God is patiently waiting for his prodigal sons and daughters to come back. And now what happens when we come back? Or, or let me ask this question. When do we want to come back? You know, some of our children, they want to come back home, right, Cyril? When maybe when you're not, you're not able to pay, uh, so you don't have money at home, in your, you're not able to pay gas for your car you're driving. Or, you know, when you're running out of little cash, they say, well, maybe I should go back home. Well, you know, the, the, those are the times we want to return home. Or maybe for some other thing, that maybe you're missing uh, um, you know, your mom's delicious food. You know, the horrible uh, rest, uh, hotel food is, or the hostel is not giving great foods. So you want to go back home. Or you're missing. So those are the moments that you want to return home. But you know what? In spiritual sense, that's how, that's how it happens to you and me and everyone who's away from God, you're missing on something. You're longing for something. You're lacking something. And you, whatever you think you have, there is still a lack. That lack is not met by any and everything outside. Like here, prodigal uh, son, he went away. When he was home, he was good. Everything was going well, lots of servants, he wants some food. All he would say, hey, get me some hamburgers, whatever, they were, it's there. The food is there. Servants are out there to wait, of course, in those Eastern contexts I'm talking about. And everything was going well for him. Comfort, protection, security, and he could do any, he could do anything, he could have anything to his heart's content. But soon after leaving home, all the money was gone. All the money was spent. And in doing what? Wild parties, it says. Oh, I tell you, wild parties can consume all your money so quickly. You know, uh, let, me, uh, let me warn you. This friend, and the friends will be so nice to you when you're out there, as long as you what? You have some cash with you, some money on you. They're there. They're like uh, 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 the flies that uh, come around uh, over, over sweet solution or sugar. As long as the sugar is there, the flies come. And when the sugar dries up, what happens? The flies will fly away. So does with your friends, those who are out there wanting to give you all kinds of suggestions, they would leave. So that's what happened to him. 
he was he left with nothing his life became a struggle out of starvation what did he said he will go and get a job somewhere maybe in some place and no one was going to give him any job and finally he hired himself uh, to a man who sent him to the field to take care, take care of the pigs i tell you even what the pigs were saying he was probably was trying to eat what the pigs were eating and then pigs must have talked to him and said hey why don't you go out somewhere else and find some food why are you coming to steal our food <laughs> that's why it says no one gave him nothing <laughs> and so he was coming to the place of realization hmm ha ah, maybe there's something i need to think about here you know that uh, nothingness there brought everything back to his senses he came back to his senses it says and it says now this is the time for me to drive back or to go back homeward so here he was making his way back to to his home and look at this uh, if only we have the uh, cameras would capture this mood the father was looking and he saw from a long distance and then it says here he he was filled with compassion he was filled with love and he ran towards his son he embraced him and he gave him a, a bear hug and then held him so tightly and then it says but the the and then it's is kissed him all these things are are god's way of showing your home now the affection the love that embrace our heavenly father uh, uh, um exhibits towards his prodigal sons and daughters when they return but here the son was going through in uh, in in a state of repentance he said to the father father i have sinned against you both heaven and you and i'm no longer worthy of being called your son and the, the younger son perhaps he thought at least he talked about him in his mind he said okay when i go back you know i can't be your son anymore at least could you take me as one of your servants that's what he wanted uh, at least it was maybe a remote chance for him to become a servant but what god what god what the father did was extravagant it was lavishing back uh, onto this son here the love he restored him back to his sonship he called his servants say hey come on now come bring the the finest robe in the house you know i put a ring on his finger and sandals i tell you the, he had no sandals anymore all that is gone you know in that place and then and the sandals back to him and as he was doing all that what he was doing is god he was restoring him back to be his son again now let me bring that to our context here your sin and my sin takes us on a journey takes us far away from god and that sin whatever that sin the bible tells us if you are if you are if you're committing sin you become a slave to that sin so you're serving uh, you become a slave and a servant to that sin in in reality you are becoming a slave and servant to satan who is the author of sin who come, who make you to do that in the first place he makes you to do that so when you are away from home away from god you thought you're going to enjoy life people want to enjoy life in reality you cannot fully enjoy life outside of god you lose joy and you live in misery and you feel hopeless and when you come to your senses when i come to my senses and say i want to return to god in repentance we come and say god forgive me of my sin whatever that is what god what does god do he frees you up again he you know he frees you up from the grip of satan and sin and he reinstates you to be his child again and as the holy spirit affirms to your spirit as the scripture says here we become god's children amen and we call him abba father abba father you know that there is such something uh, that god would love to hear when you call him abba 
father. You know, I love to hear when my children call me papa. You know, there's something musical about it when they call me. I love that. I, uh, I, and uh, I want them to call me that way. So God is waiting for you to call him Abba, Father. That could happen today because the Spirit of God is speaking to you. Are you trying to enjoy life outside of outside of God? Well, God wants you to enjoy love. God is generous, I said to you. He lavishly pours out all those resources upon you and me to do what? To enjoy. But we think in our smartness, in our stupidity maybe, I would say, we think we know better than God. And then we pursue our own way of in search of the joy and pursuit of happiness. I tell you, you can never be fully happy unless you come back to God. Do you say amen for that? Only in God, in his presence, there is fullness of joy, and that could be yours today. He's a generous God. He is a patiently waiting God, and he is lovingly forgiving God when his, chil- when ch- when the ch- when his children repent. I want to show the fourth point here. Here is a father who truly delights in his children when they come back home. I tell you, whenever, whenever I went back home, my father would always be very happy to, to, uh, to go out and get some great foods from the, from the market, you know, and say, yeah, you know, my son is coming home, just let's cook some great food and all that. There's something the pa- parents feel delightful when their children are at home. You know, when I, I'm happy when my children are at home. You ask them, you know, I'd love to make some delicious breakfasts in the morning. Uh, my Saturday ritual is to make some lovely breakfasts. I say, would you stay home? Stay for breakfast. There's something God delights when his children, uh, especially the prodigal ones, return to home. Our God is generous. He's He's wanting to give to you. He's patiently waiting for you. And he lovingly forgives and restores. And he delightfully embraces. And he celebrates every time his one son or daughter returns home. What did the uh, um, prodigal son's father do? He called the servants and he said what? Get the, the leanest, the weakest lamb and slaughter it. What did he say? He said, get the, the fattened one. He said, we've been fattening it, he says. It says, it means from the time prodigal son left, maybe they were, he was feeding that extra feed to this uh, particular calf so that it gets fattened up. Maybe he was already thinking one day, my son might come back and I want to get that ready. He says, he says we have been fattening this particular thing. So that means that tells me God is preparing something for us when we return. What is that preparation? That is nothing but his own very presence. When we, when we come back home, we're getting into his delightful presence that we will talk about in heaven. So prodigal son comes back and then he says, you bring this fattened calf and slaughter it. There would, there's going to be a great feast And what we did afterwards is something that applies to all of us. He pronounced these words. And this is is for everyone, all of us, uh, uh, in our sinful condition. What was it? What we were like in our sinful condition. This is how we are. He said, we must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead. He was dead. And he was lost, it says here. He was dead, and now he's come back to life. He was lost, and now he is found. Dear friend, you you and I are dead in our sins. Amen? That's what the Bible tells. While we are dead in our sins, Jesus died for us. While we are still dead, when you came to Jesus, when you were in what condition? You were in dead condition. Can a dead man choose? Can he make a choice? You have no choice to make. So in other words, 
you becoming a Christian, becoming a follower of Christ was not your own choice. You were dead, not even being a, have the ability to make that choice. But the spirit has come into you and life, he's breathed his spirit again. So you come back to life and responded to his love. And you accepted his forgiveness. So it was all his doing from the beginning. Only your doing and my doing was is to run away from God in our sin. But coming to senses or making the journey back to home or repentance and all that the Spirit of God is at work in us. So now he says, we must celebrate with the feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. This is the scripture, scriptural truth we need to take, it, take into our heart here. Dear friends, there's nothing, nothing can bring joy, greater joy to the father than his son coming back home, his daughter coming back home. You know, they're happy. They are happy when the children are, 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 are with, with them. That's what our God, God feels. That's why the Bible says, you know, every time there is a, a one son, a, a one person comes to know the Lord, what is it? It says, it says there, will, there will be great rejoicing in, among the angels. Angels will be so happy every time a soul comes back to follow him. That's what, that's what God is waiting to see happen in the world. The world would recognize world. I tell there'll be much great, greater joy when people come back to him. So these are the parables that we've just looked at it here that shows how God deals with his humanity, how, how much joy that he gets when, when people make the choices to come back to him. This is what it says. There is a, a, a here the, in the psalmist uh, talks about here in Psalm 103 verses uh, uh, 8 to uh, 13. It says, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. Or he does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve for his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as from, from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is here uh, like a father to his children. It says, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. That's our God. That's the God, the Father Perhaps you never had in your life, in my life. Our Heavenly Father is so rich in mercy, so full in love and compassion. And all he was asking you is to come back to him. So today, I want to appeal to you, everyone here who's listening. Are you like that prodigal son or daughter doing your own thing? running away from God? Are you starving for affection? I said there is need in your, in your heart, in my heart, for love and to, be, uh, to, have, to receive the defection. All you need to do is to come to your senses and say, I'm going back. I don't care about anybody else, but I'm going back to my Father. And if you make one step towards God, God makes 10 steps towards you. Amen? All that you need to do is just say, God, I'm coming back. And before you finish the sentence, he's a halfway running towards you and waiting to be picked up and just shake you up perhaps and, and says, I love you. I miss you. It's about time you came back home, my son. It's about time you came back home, my daughter. Time. Let's the party begin. Let's celebrate because my son, who was, who was dead, now he's alive. My daughter, who was lost, now she's been found. Let's celebrate. Let's rejoice. Would you stand up together with me in the, in the presence of our, our loving Heavenly Father, who's out here right now, stretching his hands towards you and me. 
like he, did, he, like he does throughout the generations. Those who are out there following me from India or elsewhere right now, you just run to your Father in heaven. Let him pick you up. Let him wipe your tears away. Let him embrace, put your, put your head on, on his chest and listen to his heartbeat towards you, which says, I love you. I love you. I love you. Wouldn't let go of you to your misery. Cry out to him. You're not too far from him. Or this, you're only one step away. You may not have your earthly father, or you may have difficulties with your earthly father, but our heavenly father is totally different than any of these earthly parents. None of us could match his love, his forgiveness, his generosity, his kindness, his mercy, his long suffering. Oh, we don't we need all that. So Lord God, here we are. We are all prodigal sons and daughters without you. But Lord, we thank you. Many of us have come back to be in, the, in your presence. You've given us the right to become the children of God. But Lord, we are praying for those right now, perhaps, who are still outside, never in that embrace of you. We pray that they too will join. So together, we will celebrate. We praise you. We worship you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So worship team, take us with our closing song.
that you are good, good Father to us. None of us are perfect, Lord, but you are in all of your ways. Perfect love casts out all fear. We come to you, Lord, as your dear children, truly, dearly beloved and loved by you. And you are delighting in us. Lord, as our hearts are filled with your love, and as we receive your love, may we become the agents of love to those who are struggling in this world without fathers, without there's so much of fatherlessness, Lord. Especially I pray for um, our friends, uh, daughter Olivia, Lord, in Fiji, who's lost her father, our pastor friend. Lord, just we think of many Olivias like that around the world. You are the perfect father. Lord, would you come and touch us? Lord, in all of us, there's little child who's needing the touch of that heavenly father. So we thank you for speaking to us as we leave. May we walk in that, uh, the, the knowledge to know that we are the children of God. That's what we are, as your spirit says, in Jesus' precious name. Now the love of the father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Amen. <clears throat>